Well, Reverend Jackson, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank uh, you, sir. I want to begin by looking at your historic run for office. When you uh, laid claim to the Democratic uh, nomination, how did that pave the way for a Barack Obama presidency? I don't want to be that presumptuous, but suffice right. it to say, at some point, someone starts saying, run, just a run. And if I had not run, it was like I would have set people up right. to disappoint them. Right. So, so I ran in 84. I learned what is a surrogate. I learned the campaign in, in Iowa and New Hampshire, not just in the southern states. We were told uh, you shouldn't go to Iowa. Iowa is too white. Only to get to the find you can't be valid if you don't take it all on. So by going to Iowa, we found that the family farmer and who had lost their farm to the, to the corporate farmer and the black industry, the worker who had lost their job to the corporations going abroad, had more coming than they realized. So it was an economic class issue. Class issue. And so we began to hook up the, the family farmer and, and right. the unemployed urban worker. And out of the, a coalition was born. So we got double digits in Iowa. That was a big deal. We actually beat Gore and Gephardt in Iowa. That was a big deal. But how I many whites could hear our voices beyond the limits of race. That's significant. Uh, you mentioned that because, uh, you know, run Jesse Run where the newspaper headlines. And uh, People to this day refer to that era as one of the watershed moments in American politics, in democratic politics. Did you feel that you were on the threshold of a major change? And when you look back, do you feel it was a great move for you to have made that kind of a bold run and to really democratize the process? I didn't know how big the moment was in the moment because right. I was really running as an organizer. In the political season, the primaries, the candidates determined the agenda in the press. We couldn't get our civil rights issues raised. We were talking about urban policy and free Mandela and, and gender equality. We couldn't be heard by running, running for the presidency. And so by 88, that was an appreciation of what we brought to the conversation. I remember one night we were told, uh, Jesse, you know, tomorrow night we're going to, uh, you've been in all these debates, but we're going to discuss foreign policy. So if you don't want to come, you don't have to because we know you're, you're a foreign policy analogist. You know, we understand. I said, well, we, I said, I'm anxious to be part of the foreign policy of the conversation. They said, what do you know about foreign policy? I said, we can't be on the foreign policy. Slavery was the foreign policy. They said, oops. <laughs> <laughs> the point of the matter, we, we were trying to expand right. consciousness. Looking back, uh, what, uh, how crucial was it for students to lead activism back in the 50s and the 60s? Students basically came south and led the drive to end legal apartheid or legal segregation. We paid a bloody price for ending legal apartheid because there were those so, so vested in keeping us apart. And I found that the people are vested in keeping us apart because they exploit our apartness. So one generation fought to end segregation as a matter of law. Another generation fought for the right to vote. So now fighting to reduce student loan debt, student loan debt, rate and credit card debt, it costs too much to go to school. Many students with the best minds can't even apply to attend. University of Missouri became almost the poster child around the country for uh, diversity in higher ed. How important is it? Or they, what do you think is they, they were about diverse the on, on the football field, right? Not in the classrooms, right. not in the faculty, not in tenured professors. And the football team decided they would not play football unless it was addressed. It was interfering with that economic engine and PR magnet called football. That's what captured the nation's attention. And those young men uh, made a statement to the nation. Bernie Sanders made it clear on the campaign trail to let us know, Senator Bernie Sanders, that he supported your run in the 80s for president. And he built lightly his populism on your campaign of the 80, 84 and 88 in, in challenging the status quo and so forth. He brought a lot of people around th this movement, the Sanders movement, around democratic politics. Uh, what happens to that movement now moving forward as they demand account political accountability? Those who were in that movement must be long distance runners. If they let their inspiration evaporate or turn into vapor now, it was just a, a fad. They must not allow themselves not to vote feverishly to fulfill the mission. I would think that Dr. King would find a certain joy in this moment. He would urge us in, in the classroom watching this, deep, this taping, you get a classmate with whom you're not comfortable, I mean a, a roommate. Uh, don't, eat, don't eat in your silo. Uh, 
identify your own ethnic kin or your own religious group or your athletic partners, but join the universe, the universitas, the universal community. If you come to the University of Michigan uh, four years later and you've learned that lesson, you can cope with a challenging world. If you've just learned how to survive in your silo, you live beneath your privilege. So learn to live, share, and grow together. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you, sir. Right. The Reverend Jesse Jackson, founder and president of the Rainbow Push Coalition, America's premier civil rights leader. I'm Ben Calais Thompson.